The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. Welcome to the show. Hope everybody had a good weekend. We're live on YouTube, 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, as we always are, Monday through Thursday, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern. We also are welcoming everybody watching from the, uh, we, uh, we, hold on, I don't want to get it mixed up. I love it when I wake up in the morning and Barack Obama is president Facebook page and the We Survive Bush, You Will Survive Obama Facebook page, both Facebook pages. Yes, they are. All right. I talked last week very briefly about if Hill. we didn't want to get too much into 2016, right? But I was just throwing out there, if Hillary Clinton runs in 2016, she will essentially be one of the most qualified presidential candidates that I can remember, and I outlined why. I don't want to re-outline it here because I did last week, but you can check out that clip in our archives. So now Newt Gingrich is coming out and saying, you know what? If Hillary Clinton runs in 2016, Republicans may be currently are incapable of competing with that. And he outlines the reasons why. Let's check this out. This is some fascinating video. Let's take a look, Lewis. In 16 is going to be Hillary Clinton, supported by Bill Clinton and presumably a still relatively popular President Barack Obama. Trying to win that will be truly the Super Bowl. And the Republican Party is today is incapable of competing at that level. Okay, so that's pretty interesting stuff because Newt Gingrich, uh, for all of his insane hyperbole and comparisons of himself to everyone from Margaret Thatcher to Moses to Pericles to Ronald Reagan to Abraham Lincoln, every once in a while, (laughs) he says something that's pretty honest and pretty reasonable. And he's saying we would have a problem as Republicans if Hillary Clinton is the nominee. Well, it's it's already clear that they already have problems, and I can't imagine what it's going to be like in another four years. And the polling seems to support that, Natan. A Washington Post poll found that 57% of people, not of Democrats, 57% of people in the U.S. would support Hillary Clinton as a 2016 presidential candidate. I know it's very early numbers and they don't mean that much, but she is, is looking like a pretty formidable opponent. You know, I think it's really going to depend on what uh, what happens with the economy in the next four years and what Obama's approval ratings are when he leaves. If people have a bad impression of the Democrats in four years, then they're going to have a tough time winning no matter who the candidate is on either side. Uh, so we need to take a look at that. But yeah, obviously, if things are as they are now politically, she would have a, a pretty easy time uh, at least getting 50 percent of the vote, I think. Wow. There you go. I agree. Big time stuff. Mitch McConnell, Senator Mitch McConnell, Republican Senator Mitch McConnell, filibustered himself on the debt ceiling. Did you hear about this, uh, Lewis? Uh, No, I have not. This is funny. He wanted to put this move out there to embarrass Democrats on voting on raising the nation's debt ceiling. Okay, so he proposed a vote, an up or down vote on raising the debt ceiling, and then he filibustered it when Democrats actually tried to take him up on the offer. This is so funny. He made a motion to vote on legislation which would allow President Obama to extend the country's borrowing limit on his own. Okay, Congress then would have the option to disapprove a hike. And this would be similar to what happened um, uh, last year during the standoff on the debt ceiling. So apparently Mitch McConnell didn't think that Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid, a Democrat from Nevada, would actually take him up on the offer. So he uh, thought, here's what I'll do. I'll say we'll have this vote on the debt ceiling, and then Harry Reid won't want to do the vote, and then I can go back and portray President Obama uh, uh, as someone who desires this power to raise the debt ceiling, and even his own party doesn't want him to have that. Didn't work. At first, Harry Reid objected, But then he said, you know what, I I think this is actually a good idea. Let's do it. And then Senate staff reviewed the proposal. Reid came back to the floor and said, let's do it. Let's do your up or down vote, Mitch McConnell. And McConnell was forced to say no. He basically had to admit, you know, we're talking about a perpetual debt ceiling grant in effect to the president. Matters on this of this level of controversy require 60 votes. So 60 votes are required to end a filibuster during debate on a bill and hold up a vote. This is so funny. I I specifically want Republicans to come out and defend what Mitch McConnell did as anything other than wasting time. Not going to happen because that's exactly what it is. Um, Not not great foresight on behalf of of Mitch McConnell. By the way, taxpayer money is funding these charades. These are taxpayer funded salaries that these uh, men and women have. 
and Mitch McConnell is out there trying to, it's almost like trying to do a trick shot in a basketball game when you're, you know, you have 30 seconds to go. And your opponent has the ball. Your opponent has the ball and you're down by one and you get the ball back and all of a sudden you're dribbling between your legs and throwing passes behind your back. Uh, what, what is Mitch McConnell doing here, Natan? I mean, this is just, this is absurd. Absolutely. You know, in terms of the house, um, I kind of feel sorry for John Boehner because I feel like he's a normal, uh, intelligent man who's being uh, controlled by the right wing elements of his own party, which more and more are the mainstream. But in the Senate, McConnell is just completely incompetent. I mean, this guy has no idea how to deal with being in the minority in the Senate. And this is what this is what's going on. I'm going to disagree with you on Boehner. I think he's a clown. But <laughs> But there's been four years of this nonsense. Yeah. And <laughs> well, there's been way longer than that. I mean, if we really well, want to go back. <laughs> I mean, the 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 blatant the obstruction. obstructionism to the, President the, yeah, Obama. Yeah. yeah. Republicans have been voting against their own ideas for a long time. Though. That's not anything new. No, not at all. <laughs> I mean, the individual health care mandate was their thing, and they were the biggest opponents during the Obamacare debate. Right. In any case, we'll continue to see whether Republicans continue filibustering their own proposals. Sean Hannity almost exploded when Ann Coulter went on his show and said, you know what? We did lose the election. Republicans should actually give in to President Obama on increasing the taxes on the richest Americans. Here's Ann Coulter on the Sean Hannity show. Let's take a look at this exchange. Job creators. How about they pass a bill that extends all the Bush tax cuts? What's wrong with that? They could, but it'll be rejected in the Senate. Okay, and the then question who's is to blame? then what happens? Well, then who's to blame? Okay, fine, let's do that. But in the end, at some point, if the Bush tax cuts are repealed and everyone's taxes go up, I promise you Republicans will blame for it. It doesn't mean you cave on everything, but there's some things Republicans do that feed into what the media is telling is telling America about so you Republicans. Want to say, you, oh, wait a minute, I want to make sure I understand. So are you saying then, for PR purposes, that they should give in to Obama on the tax rate? Um, not exactly. Well, yeah, I guess I am. But I You're think you should have... You're saying they capitulate to Obama, who's... We don't have a revenue problem, Ann. We lost the election, Sean. We won the election in the House and the government. Well, okay, and, and even that's not really true. As we know, because of gerrymandering and redistricting, redistricting, the Republicans won more seats in the House. But actually, Republican House candidates received less votes than Democratic House candidates, essentially losing the popular vote in the House of Representatives. But you know what? I, I am agreeing with Ann Coulter here. I'm sure deep down her motives are motives I would probably not agree with. But even a broken clock is right twice a day. I mean, this is, seems to be a pretty straightforward issue when it comes to the taxes. Yeah. I rarely agree with Ann Coulter. But, I mean, not only from a PR standpoint, doesn't more than half the country want this? Yeah, that's the thing. It's, forget about, it's from I a, think it's from far a, more than half the country. If we looked, Natan, at all of the exit polls and all of the polling, Overwhelmingly, Americans believe that the top marginal tax rate on the richest Americans should go up. And that's what that that was the source of a lot of their voting for President Obama instead of Mitt Romney. President Obama doing that is just reflecting the will of the voters. That's correct. Uh, there's a new political poll, political poll out today that reaffirms this. Now, the tax rate versus uh, loophole cutting, deduction ending, uh, raising revenues that dichotomy people don't always get that nuance and yeah. i don't think people really care and it really honestly doesn't matter if you get a certain amount of money but symbolically it would be a victory for obama if the rates go up even a little bit it is and when you do some across we'll talk about it in another seg segment but when you do across the board loophole or deduction elimination you are often disproportionately hurting the poorer people who need those deductions more if that makes sense. But that's kind of another issue, Lewis. Right. Yeah. Can't get into that now. Fox News viewers average age is 65 years old. Interesting. Who has the most watched news network in all the land? Fox News. Who has the oldest audience in all of cable news? Also Fox News, Lewis. If I had to guess who had the oldest audience, I would have guessed Fox News for sure. This is a survey released by analyst Steve Sternberg, and he says that Fox News has the oldest audience among the fully distributed cable networks, and that their average viewer last season was 65 years old, according to Nielsen. Its viewers are even older than the viewers of the Hallmark Channel, the Military Channel, and the Golf Channel. Now, it's not like Fox is really that much of an outlier when it comes to cable news networks. CNN wasn't too far behind average age of 63, MSNBC average age of 50, 59, and CNBC 52 years old. Now, what are the youngest fully distributed cable channels? This is interesting. Oxygen, 
Oxygen Network, followed by Bravo, and interestingly enough, VH1 Classic, which is the one that show, shows older stuff, then Travel, tra Travel Channel and TLC, all averaging about 42 years old. Now, if ever there is an indication of how the news horizon, the news channel atmosphere is changing, it is those numbers. Because when you compare to our audience, 70% of which is under 55 years old, half of which, almost half of which is under 44 years old, we're clearly seeing we may not even really be seeing a shift. There is some of it, somewhat of a shift going on, but it's also just the pie is changing. In other words, there are people who are just, rather than switch, I don't think, think that most of our audience is switching to us from Fox News. It's just people who otherwise weren't consuming news are starting to, and it's shows like this, Sam Cedar, The Young Turks, etc. Right, so 20 years from now, what do you see Fox News' situation looking like unless they That's fundamentally the thing. change what they do? Do we become Fox News in 20 years so that the same audience sticks with us? Are we just seeing a change in what, and who and how news is consumed? And by, I don't know, Natan, what do you think? It's hard to say. I mean, yeah. Fox News is like a relatively new creation. And so, mean, is, uh, so is this type of program that we do. Right, but, uh, but what I'm saying is Fox is kind of more to the right than the mainstream conservatives and the mainstream Republican Party was even 15 to 20 years before then. So it's almost a move to the right, not an accurate portrayal of what happens to an adult when right. they get older. For sure. For sure. I think we're in a new, we're, it's uncharted territory. Yes. Very hard to predict what will happen, especially considering that news stations and, and media outlets can change and adapt. So who knows Absolutely. What'll happen. let's do a book recommendation made possible in part by A Fashion of Bastards by Joanna Louise Johnson, which, according to the Culture Buzz, is absolutely irresistible, even though it begs the all too serious question, when does high level self-serving manipulation reach the tipping point of permanent harm to our planet? Check it out, A Fashion of Bastards. I'm sticking with my nonfiction recommendations. I first did something like 15 or 20 fiction book recommendations. These are books that I personally read and I'm recommending to you, clear, clear and simple. I'm going to stick with nonfiction because people have been, have been asking for more of those. Here is a book that I really like and recommend to you. It's called How We Decide by Jonah Lehrer. Now, we interviewed Jonah Lehrer on the show months ago, and I read his, his book before that. And uh, I, I think it's a fantastic book. It goes through a lot of its behavioral economics. It's somewhat psychology. It's somewhat neuroscience. It's very easy to read. I think I read it on a couple of flights just uh, 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 I mean, it's really a pretty quick read and you get a lot out of it, including the psychology of how people make financial decisions, which is fascinating. Some of the, the what goes on in the brain when people are, uh, when decisions and choices are framed in different ways. What is the effect of having too many options sometimes? At what point is more information actually a hindrance for making good decisions rather than something that helps you? Really, really good book, How We Decide by Jonah Lehrer. Check it out. Send me your thoughts about it. I think it's a really great book. Um, uh, one of my personal favorites, Lewis, in the, in the genre. Thank you, David. Great right. recommendation. Thank you. We have a bonus show. We have this regular show, which is an hour long, but then we have a bonus show. It's available to our paid members, which, of course, are the number one source of support for this program. On today's bonus show, we'll talk about three great stories. Number one, brain cells created from urine. And could this finally be a, a alternative to those embryonic stem cells? Interesting stuff. We'll talk about black boxes in your car, like the ones in airplanes. And we'll also talk about Syrian rebels building a tank on a car chassis. It's pretty incredible. DavidPakman.com slash membership. Sign up. We'll take a break. Plenty more stories after this. Stay tuned. The David Pakman Show at davidpackman.com. The David Pakman Show is made possible in part by Greenfield Savings Bank, building strong communities one account at a time with offices in Greenfield, Amherst, Conway, Shelburne Falls, South Deerfield, and Turner's Falls, and online at greenfieldsavings.com. Feedback video and animation at feedbackvideo.net. DIF Design, specializing in custom business websites at difdesign.com. ShareFile, provider of secure file transfer for businesses at sharefile.com. Once again, there's a tempest brewing in the national teapot. We're talking secession. Well, some of us are. Actually, very few. And 
Some of them aren't too tightly wrapped. There's now a secession drive in a mess of red states. But it started right here in my crazy state of Texas, when someone identifying himself only as Micah H. posted a petition on the White House website shortly after President Obama's re-election. Expressing exasperation with Obama's policies, Micah demanded that we Texans be allowed to decamp from the Union and become our own separate nation. Bam! Micah's petition exploded in the blogosphere, drawing raucous applause and huzzas. Naturally, most of the cheering came from out-of-staters, delighted with the thought that Texas and its notoriously nutty right-wing political leaders might leave. In case that nuttiness factor was in doubt, a GOP official in southeast Texas rushed out to demonstrate the intellectual depth of the secessionist sentiment by militantly declaring, We must contest every single inch of ground and delay the baby-murdering, tax-raising socialist at every opportunity. In due time, he added, the maggots will have eaten every morsel of flesh off the rotting corpse of the Republic, and therein lies our opportunity. By maggots, he meant Obama supporters, but I guess you knew that. This is Jim Hightower saying, many in the national media have expressed shock and alarm that Micah's online petition has drawn some 118,000 digital signatures. But get a grip. Let's remember that there are more than 26 million Texans including three and a half million Obama voters. So, sorry, America, but Texas isn't going anywhere. And even if it did, Austin has already filed a counterpetition to then secede from Texas and operate as its own state within the U.S. Hightower's commentary is brought to you by the Hightower Lowdown. From Wall Street to Washington, this monthly newsletter reveals who's doing what to whom and why. Check it out, hightowerlowdown.org. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Gretchen Kuda Crowen. Got a minute? Ticks are bad news. They spread Lyme disease and Rocky Mountain spotted fever, and they're also responsible for an unusual food allergy to meat. Yep, get bit by one of these buggers, and it could be bye bye barbecue. The strange allergy has been linked to the particularly aggressive Lone Star Tick. These tiny ticks are found primarily in the southeastern United States, the same place as most of the known cases of the meat allergy, or so it seemed. Researchers from Viracor, a company offering a diagnostic test for the allergy, found that the allergy is also appearing in places without the ticks, as far away as Hawaii. Experts aren't entirely sure why. The ticks may be spreading, the allergy can possibly be triggered by other tick species, or people are frequently getting bitten while traveling. The data was presented at the meeting of the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. The bottom line? Regardless of where you live, if you're going to be outdoors and you love meat, get out the deet. Thanks for the minute. For Scientific American 60 Second Science, I'm Gretchen Kuda Crowen. Welcome back to The David Pakman Show. We're getting into the holiday gift buying season. Remember, anything you buy on Amazon.com can be used to support The David Pakman Show. Here's what I mean. Before going to Amazon, go to davidpakman.com, click on the black banner on the right side of the page, which links to Amazon, bookmark it, and then just use that link to do all of your shopping. You'll send 7% of your purchase to The David Pakman Show instead of to Amazon.com. Big, big news happening on that front, Lewis. Also, what else can people do? They can become David Pakman Show members, made possible in part by liberalbias.com. Did you know, Lewis, that doing study after study shows that increasing taxes on the rich does not kill jobs? Isn't that weird? Obviously, one possible conclusion is that the word study must itself be a liberally biased word. Hmm. Seems to be, uh, seems to be the case. <laughs> Find out more at liberalbias.com. Today's new member of the day, A very special hello and thank you to Toby Vaughn. Toby Vaughn is a new David Pakman Show member. Not that new, actually. We're a little bit behind on these announcements. That's a good problem to be having, Lewis, I'll tell you. It's great to have Toby aboard. Of course. What was that? Every time I hear the name Toby, I think of in junior high. What's that movie where it's like, is it, I think, is it from Roots? 
where it's, it, he says his name is Toby, or they say, say your name is Toby, but it's something else. But his name is Kunta Kinte, and right. they're, they're whipping him. Isn't it LeVar Burton? Yeah. In Roots, right? Yeah, right. Am I remember right? Yeah, yeah. Every time I hear the name Toby, that's what I think to. I was quite shocked, actually, when we were shown that in it's junior pretty high. brutal movie. It is pretty brutal, yeah, I'll say. Okay, a couple announcements. Number one, we are getting to the end of the uh, spring, no, excuse me, fall college semester. And we are now taking applications for winter and spring interns for the show. Now, you can be local to our area in Massachusetts, but we also have great distance interns. So you can be anywhere in the U.S., in college or just out of, and ideally receiving credit for the internship. Not a requirement, though. You do a whole bunch of different stuff. There's no getting coffee or anything like that. You actually work on production on the show, marketing. It's a pretty good internship, Lewis, I must say. I agree. And we give great recommendations. So please contact us through our website, davidpackman.com, if you're interested in being an intern next semester. Have those resumes ready, I must say. Please send Very them in. Good. And uh, good grammar and spelling on your emails about the internship. That's just proper etiquette, you know? That goes without saying. All right, we're starting a new segment. This is going to be an internet-only segment. It's going to be called Late Night Lies. Now, let me explain. It's going to be called lies because what we're going to do is at your suggestion we will debunk or discuss common myths and lies these can be political or they can just be general whatever it is start sending them to us so you can send them from our website davidpackman.com click on contact us we're going to debunk these and it'll be a, a youtube only segment we're going to call it late night lies because these are going to go live at midnight eastern throughout the week 9 p.m pacific of course you can watch them anytime but you know we needed some kind of a uh uh, some kind of title that sounded good, you know? Right. That's a good one. I think it's good. So, send what lies do you want us to debunk? Is it, for example, I don't know, uh, pff, you shouldn't go swimming 30 minutes after, for 30 minutes after eating. Is that the type of thing you want us to debunk? Or is it more like uh, tax cuts on the rich stimulate the economy? I don't know. We'll handle any and all lies and myths, I think. Yes, but are we qualified to tackle any and all lies? Completely unqualified, but we'll just okay. cross the bridge when we come to it, when we get ones we're not qualified Works for. Works for me. And then last thing, we are in the final stages of planning our 2012 best of final show of the year, which is going to broadcast on December 31st, 2012. We're putting together some of the favorite clips and bits from the year. Send us your suggestions. So, like, I know some of my favorites. When we did the Lewis Votes special and we filmed Lewis Voting, that's got to be on the list when we ate edible bugs in the studio. That's on the list. Mm -hmm. The interview, the recent interview with Gordon Klingenschmidt and Westboro Baptist Church, I think that that's probably on there. Definitely. When Paul Cameron, anti-gay crusader, admitted to having an, a, a childhood attraction to men, that's got to be on there. Whatever you think should be on there. Like, what's one you would add, Lewis, from the year? Um, well, those are some good ones, but it's been a long year and we've done a lot of things. I, I have to think about if that. Natan, any, any that you think would be on there? Um, I don't know. I think we need to have a nice balance of right wing nutballs, uh, conservatives, and also just smart people like, you know, Richard Wolf and other people that maybe a, a couple of segments of smart intellectuals. Yeah, we're going to make it. I would up. actually, I'd say uh, Jesse Ventura. That's on there. That's actually on my list. The Jesse Ventura yeah. interview, which went viral, where he talked about Mormonism and a lot of other stuff, that will be on there. Send us your suggestions, please. Okay, let's get into some stories here. Obamacare saved consumers 1.5 billion dollars with a B in a year. This is uh, a result of a couple of different things. Number one, the health care law requires insurance companies to spend at least 80% of the premiums they collect on medical care. Okay, so this is good news for consumers. It saves consumers $1.5 billion in one year. The bad news is that some insurers are now operating at a loss because they've had to turn around at least 80% of what comes in and spend it on medical care for customers, which is really what they're in business to do. So first of all, the rule, right? This 80-20 rule means you have to spend on medical care 80% of your revenues instead of holding back for profits and retained earnings or administration and uh, you know logistical type of spending. If you don't hit that target, you actually have to rebate the difference to consumers, meaning actually return some of the premium. So certainly there's an incentive there for the insurance companies to meet the 80%. Now, when we looked at how this actually played out, where did this 1.5 billion come from? There were 1.1 billion in rebates paid out. There, have been a, there was a $350 million cut in administrative costs. So this is about 1.45 billion in premiums, uh, a reduction in premiums in 2011. So let's talk about the downside, right? Because, well, if companies are losing money, eventually wouldn't they just get out? Wouldn't they get out of the business? Well, maybe. However, 
you're forgetting one thing. They, no longer, they don't yet have all of those new customers that they will be receiving because people are mandated to have health care coverage. So the individual health care mandate goes into effect in 2014. It's going to change these numbers. It's going to drastically increase the premium paying customer base for these companies. And I would be very surprised if this meager savings maintains and translates into an actual loss once that happens, because you're talking about 30 million new customers. Right. This was, of course, carefully crafted. Uh, they didn't just throw this together. I mean, these numbers are there because it's supposed to work once right. all these people join. And so far, all of the things that are supposed to be happening are happening. Right. And it'll be fascinating to see how it continues. Now, let's talk for a second here about deficit reduction, budget shrinking, without hurting the economy. Okay, let's talk about this. I am going to present to you, there's so many different things that can and should be done, but I just want to present three that really just make sense economically that we should do. Natan, let's put up the image here, which outlines my plan, if we can. Yep, got it on. Okay, and let's, let's put it up also so I can see it, if we can, just so I know exactly what's going on. There we go. This is the logic and reason program, Lewis. I'm going to present to you a three-point plan. Number one, we need to increase taxes on people making over $250,000 a year from 35% top marginal tax rate to 39%. Now, what's interesting about those numbers? Number one, they are way, way, way lower than under Ronald Reagan. Okay. One of the biggest tax cutters, supposedly, even though he voted to increase taxes, as we know. But the meme, the Republican well, meme we is... We can't let history and, and facts get in the way of, uh, of, our, of the Republican agenda. I yeah. would never dare do that, Lewis. Yeah. Seven of Reagan's eight years in office, the top tax rate was higher than, than uh, the current 35%. In six of those eight years, it was over 50%. I say, let's go back to the 39% top marginal tax bracket. Remember, on your first 250K... It's not affected. It's just on the money you make above and beyond 250000 Now, this would raise about $850 billion in a decade, okay? Uh, fair enough. Now, what if, what if people say, well, 250000 still isn't that rich? I'm okay with that. You know what? I would actually say, if you have a family of four living in New York City and you gross 250000 it's true that you may not be swimming in money. I, I will entertain that for a second. Let's raise it to 43% for people making over $500,000 a year. What about that, okay? Common sense here. We're not affecting uh, uh, low uh, earners here. Number two, just obvious. Legalize, regulate, and tax marijuana. I mean, Lewis, at this point, we know that cigarettes are so far above and beyond harmful as is marijuana. You know that I actually get really annoyed when my ex-neighbors used to uh, be smoking in their basement and it would drift through my place. I found it annoying, I didn't like the smell. That being said, how can I logically argue that cigarettes should be legal, but marijuana should be illegal? Legalize, regulate, and tax. We're talking about $7.7 .7 billion a year in savings because you don't have to spend money policing and prosecuting marijuana. You're talking about $6.2 billion, according to some Harvard estimates, in revenue from taxing. And this doesn't even take into consideration if we change this, this we can change prison policy. And look at what would happen to the cost of incarceration if we get these people out of jail. Yes, this is not one of, one of your three points here. This isn't one that just doesn't hurt the economy. This would be an economy booster. Absolutely. We're talking about an industry here. I mean, there would be lots of job growth. And what's the big elephant in the room we have to talk about? Point number three, reduce defense spending. Let's close. I mean, look, we've got over 1,800 army bases, about 1,000 navy bases, about 1,800 air force installations, marine facilities in the hundreds. In Italy, we have over 100 installations. Do you think we might still be safe if in Italy the U.S. only had 65 military installations? I'd feel just as comfortable. I'd feel, I would too. Let's cut that. What about in Germany? Just the army alone has 50 bases. I'd be safe, I think, with only 25 American military bases in Germany. I really think I would. I agree. Yeah. Unfortunately, this is... Uh... It seems to be off the table across the board. I think it, it, it almost is. If I, we don't have an increase in defense spending, it, yeah. it's bad. It's, this is mind-boggling, but uh, I think this is the, probably the number one thing we need to do. No question about it. All right, before we go to break, very quickly, let's raise the minimum wage. Let's talk about the minimum wage a little. People may not realize it, but the minimum wage now is lower than it was in 1968. A recent study from the National Employment Law Project pointed out that the minimum wage today buys you about 30% less than it did in 1968. What should it be today to have kept up? Forget about 
actual increases, just to keep up with inflation, okay? Today, the minimum wage should be $10.55 per hour. There are no states, of the 50 states in this country, there are zero states where a minimum wage worker can afford a two-bedroom apartment working 40 hours per week. There just isn't a single state, Lewis, where that's possible. There are 10 states that annually increase their minimum wage to keep up with cost of living. That leaves 40, which don't. And this disproportionately affects women. If you look at the chances that an adult minimum wage worker is a woman, it is 64 out of 100. If you look at the chances that a Fortune 500 CEO is a woman, only four out of 100. This minimum wage thing is, in a way, part of the war on women. And maybe it's part of the, not war, but kind of casual neglect on right. women. I think that's maybe a, a fair way to say it. Yeah. Let's just get the minimum wage back to what it was 40, 44 years ago. That's not that crazy. No, but this is this is also going to be hard to do if you try and push this uh, across the board federally. Uh, can you imagine the opposition? Oh, it'd be crazy. Yeah, yeah. it'd be it, it's it's absurd. Right. No question about it. All right, let's take a break. Please join us on Facebook, facebook.com slash David Pakman Show. Get yourself some David Pakman Show gear, like the T-shirt Lewis is wearing at davidpakman.com slash gear. These make great gifts. A lot of people asking Santa and whoever else there is for our gear. Check it out. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. The David Pakman Show is made possible in part by Greenfield Savings Bank, building strong communities one account at a time with offices in Greenfield, Amherst, Conway, Shelburne Falls, South Deerfield, and Turner's Falls, and online at greenfieldsavings.com. Repair the World Apparel, offering eco-friendly clothing manufactured using no new natural resources or chemical dyes, available at repairtheworldnow.com. ShareFile, provider of secure file transfer for businesses at sharefile.com. I'm Matt Rothschild, the editor of The Progressive Magazine, with my progressive point of view, which you can also grab off our website over at progressive.org. Several months ago, we ran a story in The Progressive by Annie Laurie Gaylor of the Freedom From Religion Foundation about how the Army was imposing spirituality tests on its recruits. Those who scored low on the test were encouraged to seek out a chaplain. When Gaylor asked the Army about its policy, they said that soldiers were free to decline to participate in what it called spiritual fitness training. But that word evidently hasn't filtered down to West Point. A senior there, Blake Page, just quit West Point to publicly protest its religious indoctrination. Page said that officers at West Point engaged in unconstitutional proselytizing, discriminated against the non-religious, and established formal policies to reward, encourage, and even at times require sectarian religious participation. For example, he said there was mandatory prayer and that cadets got extra points for taking part in religious retreats. Page was the founder and president of the West Point Secular Student Alliance and the director of the Military Religious Freedom Foundation at West Point. Now you might think, well, what did he expect when he founded such groups? The military isn't the most hospitable place for atheists. But that's the point. It should be as hospitable to them as it is to believers. We're supposed to have separation of church and state, and that means separation of church and army, too. I'm Matt Rothschild. And that's how I see it. This is the Media Matters Minute. I'm Hannah Groach Begley. With the majority of the country facing record high temperatures, CNN anchor Piers Morgan hosted a so-called debate on climate science between Bill Nye the Science Guy and professional climate misinformer Mark Morano. Here's a bit of the debate. So what's happened here is the whole movement, because now we've gone 16 years without global warming, according to the UN data, and they've now morphed into extreme weather. And we have the absurd spectacle of people claiming that acts of Congress and the United Nations can control the weather and make hurricanes less nasty and make tornado tornadoes less frequent. Okay, Bill Nye, the response. Well, we start talking about the facts. The, those uh, medieval those the warming... Facts. Piers Morgan failed to disclose that Murano has no scientific training. He also gave Murano a platform to falsely peddle climate myths on his CNN audience, lending credibility to long-debunked and unscientific climate denial falsehoods. For more on this and other stories, please visit MediaMatters.org. It's the HowdyLand.com News Bulletin. 
with Stan Douglas. Go to HowdyLand.com and click on the Funny Time special offer to receive your free sample issue today. The freeze-dried ghosts of Joseph Stalin, Winston Churchill, and Franklin Roosevelt have been brought back to life by a team of Disney reanimators just in case rumors about a cloned Hitler spill turn out to be true. Dr. Hans Wutner responded to accusations that his plan is actually a plot to jumpstart the economy with huge increases in military spending. You don't honestly believe we spent the last 60 years growing an army of artificial Hitlers and arranging for their tour buses to overturn outside of major metropolitan areas, accidentally releasing hundreds of that guy into an unsuspecting world, do you? Well, do you? And in politics today, Republican Ron Paul outlined his plan to fatten up America's poor with his great Aunt Mammy's recipe for what he calls invisible soup. The Texas congressman gave full credit to the clear vegetable-free broth and his frugal aunt for making him the healthy, rail-thin, crazy person he is today. This HowdyLand.com news bullet is stuck between Mitch McConnell's first and second molars, hoping to catch him in the act of flossing. I'm Stan Douglas. Greetings, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Thoughts, Rants, and Cold Coffee. This is Rob Lacone, your host. We're coming at you on Thursday, December 6th. Rick Santorum joins right-wing conspiracy blog World Net Daily, making Rick Santorum the first Republican to make the other Fox News correspondents look like moderates. There may be life on Mars, but based on what we know thus far, it will probably be a sausage fest. Kink.com, a San Francisco-based pornography site, is offering sex ed classes to schools with a demonstration and a QA. and a after. Okay, we'll now begin the question and answer session, and just so you know, the answer is no, none of these ladies are available for prom. Well, that does it for this segment of Thoughts, Rants, and Cold Coffee. Be sure to tune in next time. Check us out on the web at romplacone.com. That's P as in Paul, L-A-C-O-N-E. And stay safe in this crazy world of ours. This is Ron Placone signing out. The David Pakman Show depends on members and donors to stay going and growing. Think about becoming a David Pakman Show member at davidpakman.com. You get access to an entire members-only bonus show with behind the scenes and everything we didn't get to on the regular show, extra interviews, plus access to the entire lifetime archive of all of our shows, even the ones from the very beginning that I really wish nobody would ever hear again. Plus, trust me, it'll feel great to support 100% independent media. Go to davidpakman.com and become a member today. Welcome back to The David Pakman Show. You may or may not have heard by now that this prank call was made by an Australian TV, uh, Australian radio program on the, on the radio station Two Day F- FM. Maybe the name of the show is Two Day FM. In any case, this whole story, which we weren't covering because it's just not really news for this program, that uh, Prince William and Kate Middleton are, are having a baby and that Kate Mid- Middleton was in the hospital because of severe morning sickness. Okay. So that is not a story that we would have covered. But now we actually have an apparent suicide on our hands. This duo from Australia called, prank called, the hospital where Kate Middleton was staying, pretending to be the queen and asking to speak to Kate. And initially one person, one woman picked up and they asked to be transferred to to Kate. And that woman transferred the call. And then another, a nurse picked up and gave some information about, well, she's been given some fluids because she was dehydrated, blah, blah, blah. So it turns out that we heard that one of these people had committed suicide. It's not completely clear that it was connected to this incident, but it's certainly the the timing is is very suspect. And it actually appears, I'm going to play the call for you. And my biggest complaint with the call is it's just not really that funny. You know, Lewis, that I love these prank calls. Yes. We we listen to phony phone calls all the time here. Uh, But this is just not really very funny, but I'll play it for you. And it turns out that even though conventional wisdom would suggest that it's the, the second woman who is actually the one that committed suicide, my understanding is that it's the first who merely transfers the call. Right. Take a look at this. Let's just listen here. Hello, good morning. King Edward Seven, Oh, hello there. Could I please speak to Kate, please, my granddaughter? Oh, yes. Just hold on. Um... Thank you. Are they putting us through? Yes. <laughs> If this has worked, it's the easiest prank call we've ever made. Your accent sucked, by the way. I just want you to know. 
I'm not used to playing old 80 year olds. What about this then? Kate, my darling, are you there? Um, good morning, Mum. This is uh, the nurse speaking. So then it's the then it's the nurse. So apparently it's that first woman, and uh, now these individuals are being blamed. They've been pulled off the air immediately. This is a show that I did a little bit of research. Apparently, they once committed another prank where they bullied a teenage girl into admitting on air when she was twelve that she had been raped, and then asking her to uh, uh, then come out to her mom about it or something like that. The story is unclear, but they have some weird stuff in their past, Lewis. And here's a little bit of an interview done with them where they are, of course, very, very contrite now. They are now very upset. Let's take a look. And, and by the way, who, would, who wouldn't be upset if, you, if this happened after a prank call you did? I ask you at the outset, you're under enormous pressure at the moment. I'd like to know that you're absolutely sure you're up to doing this. Yeah. You're okay? Mel, are you okay? Yeah. All right. If it gets too much, let me know and we'll take a break. I think we should go back to when the prank call was, was first made. Whose idea was it? It was just, you know, the team sitting down before the show just, you know, had the idea for just a simple harmless phone call that, you know, when we thought about making a call, it was, it was going to go for 30 seconds. There was just, we were going to be hung up on. Okay, so there's a little bit of that interview, and you can find the whole thing online if you want to see it. What do you think about this? I mean, it's like, you know, we don't really understand how seriously the royal family is taken. So is being pranked and really thinking that it's the queen and it turns out it's an Australian DJ, is that, is that enough to make someone kill themselves? Is every indication that this woman probably had a lot going on and that this was... Maybe the thing that pushed it over the edge. I mean, what can we really say here? I always hesitate to blame random DJs for a call. Uh, it's just, it's all, it's such a bizarre story. Very hard to believe that, uh, considering the amount of interaction there was there, um, that the phone call was the reason she killed herself. I mean, all she did was answer the phone and say, hello, how can I help you? Hold on one second. Right. And that was it. Yeah. Um, it seems if anyone should be embarrassed, it should be the other nurse. Uh who gave out information about what treatment was being given. Even then, it still seems pretty harmless. Although maybe the system at the hospital is, if the call gets to that nurse, it's assumed it's been properly screened. She, you know, yeah. We don't know, we don't know. It's just I, I just, I hate this because it's, you know, on the one hand, I like phony phone calls, and the odds of something like this happening are so low, but to say that completely unprovoked, that a normal person with no other issues is going to commit suicide over it seems like a stretch, but maybe we don't understand the culture around the royal family. I don't know. Maybe not. Um, there does seem to be a lot of uh, attachment and uh, fervor, yeah. if you will, around the, the royal family and what they do. But you know what? If you had asked me beforehand if this was a, a funny idea, I would have said, yeah, that's kind of a funny idea. I mean, just have someone pretend to be the queen. Yeah, it wasn't like, that funny, but the, the concept isn't one that's that dumb. I mean, it's like, okay, it's funny, pretend to be the queen. Yeah, seems, seems harmless to me. They I just mean, didn't pull it off in a very funny way, but that's kind of, it's, it's not right. really the point. So I, I think there is probably something else going on here. A father accidentally shot and killed his seven-year-old son outside of a gun store. This is a really disturbing story. This is, uh, um, the boy was Craig Loffrey, and his father, Joseph Loffrey, was putting the boy into the back seat of the car, and his gun, a nine-millimeter handgun, accidentally went off, and it shot the boy. The man had unloaded the gun at home. He didn't realize there was still a bullet in the chamber. That's Police. a pretty novice mistake. Now, here's that. I, I, I want to get into that because immediately all gun owners say, you always assume it's loaded, and when you unload it, you always check to see if there's a bullet in the chamber. But the reality is, if this had happened to someone else, I would probably bet that this same guy would be saying, that's a novice mistake, would never happen to me, right? Could Until very it does. Well be. Until it does. And also, how, how common is it that a 9mm just goes off? Not very common. Uh, if you asked me, I'd say he probably did not have a holster or a proper holster. It might have been just tucked into his belt, his uh, pants. Or I his don't pocket. know that much about guns, but in the research I did, it doesn't seem that common for nine millimeters to simply go off. No, uh, guns don't. I mean, you could, in most cases, you could take one and throw it against the wall and it won't go off. I mean, it's very rare. Unlikely that charges are going to be filed here. You can imagine now the life that the, this man, Joseph Loffrey, has to have knowing that he killed his own son with, with, in a gun accident. What's your thought on this, Natan? 
Well, it seems pretty clear that if the seven-year-old son had had a gun of his own, he could have protected himself against his father. Right. Why well, which are you we know not... is the only dumb line that we're going to hear from the NRA. Why aren't we hearing that? Because when we, with Jovan Belcher, after Bob Costas made his rant, which was quoting someone else, the NRA people said, Jovan Belcher's girlfriend should have had a gun. Now, is this different because this is a minor? At what age does it simply become obvious that you carry a gun for protection? Obviously, it's absurd because in this case, it wasn't even a dangerous situation. The gun simply went off accidentally, as far as we now know, as weird as that sounds. Uh, yeah, no, Natan makes a good point, which is, which is how far can you take the, the person who got shot should have had a gun? Yeah, I, I, don't think, I don't think that will apply here. I don't think anyone is, is dumb enough to make that claim when you're talking about a kid that's being loaded into a safety seat. Right. But, I mean, I think what's going on here is just improper gun safety. Right. No question about it. Uh, a mother shoplifting from Walmart was shot dead by a Texas cop in front of her two children. This happened just a few days ago in a Houston Walmart. Three women were observed stealing items, okay? They were concealing items in their purses, uh, basically petty shoplifting. There was an off-duty sheriff's deputy who was in the employment of Walmart that night as part of their loss prevention team. He accosted the women when they tried to leave. A struggle ensued, and the women started running out. They uh, then were involving Deputy Lewis Campbell of the Harris County Sheriff's Department, 26 years of seniority, he got involved. He was on duty. And uh, the woman, Shelly Fry, started running. She was able to get to her car, which also had her two small children. Deputy Campbell caught the women as they were attempting to drive away, opens the driver's side door with Shelly Fry in the driver's seat. She tries driving away. Uh, the sheriff draws his weapon, shoots her in the neck. The vehicle drove off, but her injuries were not superficial. The, she ended up crashing the car and uh, she was unable to be revived after being found unconscious. Now, there's a lot of views on this. One view is, hold on a second, uh, the off-duty officer who started this confrontation at the time was not a police officer. He was acting as loss prevention for a private company. He had no business going as far as he did. He is supposed to, uh, as, as people tell their employees, if someone leaves the store or attempts to leave, you call the police with a description, right? He wasn't on duty and stealing is wrong, but it is not a crime punishable by death. The situation then escalates. We don't know exactly what the catalyst was. Was it the off-duty officer's re reaction? We don't know. And now we have a situation where someone is driving off and apparently one of the women hit the police officer with her purse. And we end up with shots being fired in front of children and the mom crashing the car, dying. Fortunately, it appears the kids are okay. We weren't there to say with a calm, rational mind what should or shouldn't have happened, right? I mean, confrontations are not calm. W the women were aggressively resisting. They were fleeing. However, the idea that shoplifting leads to a, a death by, by gun is concerning. Yeah. Um, you have to wonder if the cop made any sort of effort to assess the situation and look at his surroundings. Uh, there were two kids in the car. He shot this woman while she was in the car. Who knows what can happen with those bullets rattling around ricocheting. Yeah. Uh, it just seems completely insane to me. That the that's question what is, was deadly force the next thing on the list? Or were there other options? That's really the question. And it's hard to argue that deadly force necessarily had to become the next option here. Uh, seems unlikely. Um, I don't think the cop was threatened with uh, any sort of dangerous weapon. So maybe he thought the woman was going to run him over. Who knows? I mean, I, I don't know. But it, it seems it seems a bit crazy to to just start shooting in a situation like that. It does. OK, let's take a break. I still have a couple more things I want to get to. Make sure to check out our show on Stitcher, stitcher.com slash David Pakman show. The best way to get the show on your iPhone or Android phones. I use it on my Android phone. We'll take a break back after this. Plenty more. Stay tuned, including your voicemail. Some good voicemails today. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. Yeah. 
The David Pakman Show is made possible in part by Greenfield Savings Bank, building strong communities one account at a time with offices in Greenfield, Amherst, Conway, Shelburne Falls, South Deerfield, and Turner's Falls, and online at greenfieldsavings.com. Repair the World Apparel, offering eco-friendly clothing manufactured using no new natural resources or chemical dyes, available at repairtheworldnow.com. Feedback video and animation at feedbackvideo.net. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Gretchen Kuda Crowen. Got a minute? A crocodile's thick, rough skin looks like an impenetrable suit of armor, but the croc skin actually confers a delicate sense of touch that's among the most acute in the animal kingdom. That's according to a study in the Journal of Experimental Biology. Researchers found that the small spotted bumps that cover the skin of crocodiles and alligators are chock full of nerve endings that are exquisitely sensitive to pressure and vibration, even more sensitive than human fingertips. These touch sensors are especially good at detecting the vibrations caused by tiny water ripples, something that may help the animals locate swimming prey. And the most sensitive areas were found near the face and teeth, likely helping the animals to identify and manipulate objects with their mouths, crucial for crocodile females who must delicately carry and protect hatchlings in their powerful jaws. Researchers say they've known about the spotted bumps for years, but because of crocodile skin's tough armor-like appearance, they simply assumed their function was something other than feeling. The lesson? Never judge a croc by its cover. Thanks for the minute. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Gretchen Kuda Crowen. I'm Ben Knuckles, and this is Take Two Movie Review. This week, Israel comes to collect. The debt is a Ferrari of a thriller, which may sound like an odd way to describe a movie about three Mossad agents who must confront the truth of what happened on a 30-year-old mission. Director John Madden's expertly crafted film treads lightly on the moral and political complications of Israel's attempts to bring Nazi war criminals to justice. As it should be, Madden's focus is on first-rate cinema. Based on an Israeli movie, The Debt is a good yarn, with a fast-paced, intricate plot and psychologically complex characters. Madden begins by weaving elegantly between 1966, when the young agents embarked on their mission to capture a mass murderer known as the Surgeon of Birkenau, and 1997, when they remain burdened by their actions. The cast is spot on. The older agents are played by the formidable trio of Helen Mirren, Tom Wilkinson, and Kieran Hines while Jessica Chastain, Martin Sakas, and Sam Worthington play their younger selves. It's Chastain who carries the debt through its most compelling set pieces. The former Nazi is working as a fertility specialist in East Berlin, and in order to get close to him, she must submit to multiple examinations. As the surgeon, Jesper Christensen proves again that Nazis make the best villains. He's a monster who's also charming, insightful, and empathetic. You may wonder how the movie's final act could live up to what came before, but don't underestimate Mirren, who brings the taciturn weariness of a great action hero. The Debt is a serious film that never abandons its genre roots. This has been Take Two Movie Review. I'm Ben Knuckles. Catch up with me at TakeTwoMovieReview.com and follow me on Facebook and Twitter. This program is produced by WNRN Charlottesville, Virginia. Production and distribution are made possible in part with funds from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. The David Pakman Show is made possible by listeners like you. To get a commercial-free version of our podcast, as well as all of our other member benefits, go to davidpakman.com slash membership. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. Our program is mostly funded by you. Please become a David Pakman Show member by going to davidpakman.com slash membership. Very, very affordable and goes a long way to growing this show and supporting independent media. Thank you, Lewis. Glad to be here. All right. Text messages direct to your contact lenses. You know, a while ago, I said that the next step from the Google glasses is that you actually get the images, text messages, computer screen, information, Wikipedia, whatever, right in your contact lens. Lewis just last week indicated that this technology was decades, maybe 50 years away. It turns out that Ghent University Center of Microsystems Technology has developed a spherical curved LCD display 
which is embeddable into contact lenses and handles projected images using wireless technology. The basic technology is already there, Lewis. What do you think? Uh, I'm willing to bet the it's it's more basic than even the description makes it sound. Hmm. I'm willing to bet that I I stand by my claim that what we really think about what we what we see in sci-fi movies or read about in books or see in video games is still at the very least, 10 years away. I think this is just another one of those stories we read about and never hear anything about. I think we'll have good prototypes of this within five years. That's my idea. Imagine, I could simply, I could be walking around and uh, all of a sudden I need to give an impromptu speech and it doesn't look like I have a teleprompter, but I'm actually, it's in my contact lenses. I'm just reading it. It's incredible. Imagine what would happen to politicians. You would never really know, are they this good at speaking or do they have contact lens teleprompters going on? I'm sure we'll know. How would <laughs> you, you get a sense we'll know? Yeah. There's actually a, there's a book, I think it's called Rainbow's End by Werner Vinge that I've read where this technology exists. And you realize, and, and I apologize if it's the wrong book, but I think it is. And you realize that people are kind of looking at their internal display because their eyes kind of glaze over. And when you're having a conversation with them, they kind of are looking over at you or to the side of you. Kind of like what happened often in uh, uh, middle school history classes to the teacher. But that aside that you can kind of tell because their eyes start to drift. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, I'm not excited about this. Can not you yet. imagine what sexting would be like with this? Jeez. Just don't do it while you're driving. Right. There you go. Okay, let's go to your voicemail. A lot of voicemail coming in. Our phone number is 219-2-DAVID-P. Here's a voicemail from the Eggman on the idea of dogs babysitting children. Hi, guys. I have a comment to make about leaving a dog as a babysitter. I think each case has to be handled individually. My oldest daughter is of borderline babysitting age. I leave her to, ba to babysit my other daughter. However, I also have a pit bull and a German shepherd that watch my house with, uh, that are family pets. I know for a fact that if anybody came to my front door, my dog would scare the crap out of them. And he's also the sweetest, friendliest dog to my family. So my dogs are excellent babysitters. Also, um, if they can drive cars, whatever, they can babysit. But um, my pit bull makes all white people shit their pants when they see him bark at them. And my German shepherd makes all people of color shit their pants when they see him. Is that a racist thing? It's just it's something that I've noticed, that's all. Hey, um, you guys have a great day. Shalom. All right, so interesting from the Eggman. I, now, I, I have to say... If you have a daughter who is able to call 911 and maybe prepare some food if necessary, and she's almost babysitting age, then I can understand why simply having the dog there as a security thing would make you comfortable leaving your two daughters uh, alone. However, leaving the dog only is a little bit different. Yes. And uh, the infant was in a room by itself. Right. That, that's bad. All right. Let's keep going. Plenty more voicemails here. Hello, David. Uh, my name is Daryl, calling from Marietta, California. Okay. And my question is reg with regards to your guest that was on the Bill O'Reilly show, and O'Reilly made the ridiculous comments that Christianity is not a religion. And your conversation with this gentleman, I believe, was geared towards, uh, I mean, he's an atheist, and the religious holiday of Christmas. My question, is he advocating putting it into Christmas, and what, what is the big deal about Christmas being a religious holiday? I think everybody, every honest person thinks it is a religious holiday. If that is the case, wouldn't that make Bill O'Reilly be uh, right in, in that there is a war on Christmas? So idiot. I think you misunderstood. What he was saying was simply that having a Christmas holiday be a federal holiday is an establishment of religion in the sense that it is a federally sanctioned holiday based on the religion of Christianity. So Bill O'Reilly was trying to argue that it's not because Christianity isn't even a religion. He wasn't trying to end Christmas, David Silverman. He was simply arguing that by having it a federal holiday, you are establishing a connection between religion and government. That's it for today. Leave us your voicemail. We'll be back tomorrow. Great, great show coming up. Don't miss David it. David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com.